THE AGE OF INNOCENCE by Edith Wharton Book One, Chapter Three It invariably happened in the same way. Mrs. Julius Beaufort, on the night of her annual ball, never failed to appear at the opera. Indeed, she always gave her ball on an opera night in order to emphasize her complete superiority to household cares, and her possession of a staff of servants competent to organize every detail of the entertainment in her absence. The Beauforts' house was one of the few in New York that possessed a ballroom. It antedated even Mrs. Manson Mingott's and the Headley Chiverses, and at a time when it was beginning to be thought provincial to put a crash over the drawing-room floor and move the furniture upstairs, the possession of a ballroom that was used for no other purpose, and left for three hundred and sixty-four days of the year to shuttered darkness, with its gilt chairs stacked in a corner, and its chandelier in a bag, this undoubted superiority was felt to compensate for whatever was regrettable in the Beaufort past. Mrs. Archer, who was fond of coining her social philosophy into axioms, had once said, "'We all have our pet common people,' and though the phrase was a daring one, its truth was secretly admitted in many an exclusive bosom. But the Beauforts were not exactly common, some people said they were even worse. Mrs. Beaufort belonged, indeed, to one of America's most honored families. She had been the lovely Regina Dallas, of the South Carolina branch, a penniless beauty introduced to New York society by her cousin, the imprudent Medora Manson, who was always doing the wrong thing from the right motive. When one was related to the Mansons and the Rushworths, one had a droit de cité, as Mr. Sillerton Jackson, who had frequented the Tuileries, called it, in New York society, but did one not forfeit it in marrying Julius Beaufort? The question was, who was Beaufort? He passed for an Englishman, was agreeable, handsome, ill-tempered, hospitable, and witty. He had come to America with letters of recommendation from old Mrs. Manson Mingott's English son-in-law, the banker, and had speedily made himself an important position in the world of affairs. But his habits were dissipated, his tongue was bitter, his antecedents were mysterious, and when Medora Manson announced her cousin's engagement to him, it was felt to be one more act of folly in poor Medora's long record of imprudences. But folly is as often justified of her children as wisdom, and two years after young Mrs. Beaufort's marriage it was admitted that she had the most distinguished house in New York. No one knew exactly how the miracle was accomplished. She was indolent, passive, the caustic even called her dull, but dressed like an idol hung with pearls, growing younger and blonder and more beautiful each year. She throned in Mr. Beaufort's heavy brownstone palace, and drew all the world there without lifting her jewelled little finger. The knowing people said it was Beaufort himself who trained the servants, taught the chef new dishes, told the gardeners what hothouse flowers to grow for the dinner-table and the drawing-rooms, selected the guests, brewed the after-dinner punch, and dictated the little notes his wife wrote to her friends. If he did, these domestic activities were privately performed, and he presented to the world the appearance of a careless and hospitable millionaire strolling into his own drawing-room with the detachment of an invited guest, and saying, "'My wife's gloxineers are a marvel, aren't they? I believe she gets them out from Kew.' Mr. Beaufort's secret, people were agreed, was the way he carried things off. It was all very well to whisper that he had been helped to leave England by the international banking-house in which he had been employed. He carried off that rumour as easily as the rest, though New York's business conscience was no less sensitive than its moral standard. He carried everything before him, and all New York into his drawing-rooms, and for over twenty years now people had said they were going to the Beauforts, with the same tone of security as if they had said they were going to Mrs. Manson Mingott's and with the added satisfaction of knowing they would get hot canvas-back ducks and vintage wines, instead of tepid veuve clicquot without a year, and warmed-up croquettes from Philadelphia. Mrs. Beaufort, then, had as usual appeared in her box just before the jewel-song, and when, again as usual, she rose at the end of the third act, drew her opera cloak about her lovely shoulders, and disappeared, New York knew that meant that half an hour later the ball would begin. The Beaufort House was one that New Yorkers were proud to show to foreigners, especially on the night of the annual ball. 
The Beauforts had been among the first people in New York to own their own red velvet carpet, and have it rolled down the steps by their own footmen, under their own awning, instead of hiring it with the supper and the ballroom chairs. They had also inaugurated the custom of letting the ladies take their cloaks off in the hall, instead of shuffling up to the hostess's bedroom and recurling their hair with the aid of the gas-burner. Beaufort was understood to have said that he supposed all his wife's friends had maids, who saw to it that they were properly coiffée when they left home. Then the house had been boldly planned with a ballroom, so that, instead of squeezing through a narrow passage to get to it, as at the Chiverses, one marched solemnly down a vista of enfiladed drawing-rooms, the sea-green, the crimson, and the bouton d'or, seeing from afar the many candled lustres reflected in the polished parquetry, and beyond that the depths of a conservatory, where camellias and tree-ferns arch their costly foliage over seats of black and gold bamboo. Newland Archer, as became a young man of his position, strolled in somewhat late. He had left his overcoat with the silk-stockinged footman. The stockings were one of Beaufort's few fatuities, had dawdled a while in the library hung with Spanish leather and furnished with buell and malachite, where a few men were chatting and putting on their dancing-gloves, and had finally joined the line of guests whom Mrs. Beaufort was receiving on the threshold of the crimson drawing-room. Archer was distinctly nervous. He had not gone back to his club after the opera, as the young bloods usually did, but, the night being fine, had walked for some distance up Fifth Avenue, before turning back in the direction of the Beauforts' house. He was definitely afraid that the Mingotts might be going too far, that, in fact, they might have Granny Mingott's orders to bring the Countess Olenska to the ball. From the tone of the club-box he had perceived how grave a mistake that would be, and though he was more than ever determined to see the thing through, he felt less chivalrously eager to champion his betrothed's cousin than before their brief talk at the opera. Wandering on to the Bouton d'Or drawing-room, where Beaufort had had the audacity to hang Love Victorious, the much-discussed nude of Bougereau, Archer found Mrs. Welland and her daughter standing near the ballroom door. Couples were already gliding over the floor beyond. The light of the wax candles fell on revolving tulle skirts, on girlish heads wreathed with modest blossoms, on the dashing aigrettes and ornaments of the young married women's coiffure, and on the glitter of highly glazed shirt-fronts and fresh glacé gloves. Miss Welland, evidently about to join the dancers, hung on the threshold, her lilies of the valley in her hand, she carried no other bouquet, her face a little pale, her eyes burning with a candid excitement. A group of young men and girls were gathered about her, and there was much hand-clasping, laughing, and pleasantry, on which Mrs. Welland, standing slightly apart, shed the beam of a qualified approval. It was evident that Miss Welland was in the act of announcing her engagement, while her mother affected the air of parental reluctance considered suitable to the occasion. Archer paused a moment. It was at his express wish that the announcement had been made, and yet it was not thus that he would have wished to have his happiness known. To proclaim it in the heat and noise of a crowded ballroom was to rob it of the fine bloom of privacy which should belong to things nearest the heart. His joy was so deep that this blurring of the surface left its essence untouched, but he would have liked to keep the surface pure, too. It was something of a satisfaction to find that May Welland shared this feeling. Her eyes fled to his beseechingly, and their look said, "'Remember, we're doing this because it's right.' No appeal could have found a more immediate response in Archer's breast, but he wished that the necessity of their action had been represented by some ideal reason, and not simply by poor Ellen Olenska. The group about Miss Welland made way for him with significant smiles, and after taking his share of the felicitations, he drew his betrothed into the middle of the ballroom floor, and put his arm about her waist. "'Now we shan't have to talk,' he said, smiling into her candid eyes, as they floated away on the soft waves of the blue Danube. She made no answer. Her lips trembled into a smile, but the eyes remained distant and serious, as if bent on some ineffable vision. Dear. Archer whispered, pressing her to him. It was borne in on him that the first hours of being engaged, even if spent in a ballroom, had in them something grave and sacramental. What a new life it was going to be, with this whiteness, radiance, goodness at one side! The dance over, the two, as became an affianced couple, wandered into the conservatory. 
and sitting behind a tall screen of tree-ferns and camellias, Newland pressed her gloved hand to his lips. "'You see, I did as you asked me to,' she said. "'Yes, I couldn't wait,' he answered, smiling. After a moment he added, "'Only I wish it hadn't had to be at a ball.' "'Yes, I know.' She met his glance comprehendingly. "'But after all, even here we're alone together, aren't we?' "'Oh, dearest, always!' Archer cried. Evidently she was always going to understand, she was always going to say the right thing. The discovery made the cup of his bliss overflow, and he went on gaily. "'The worst of it is that I want to kiss you, and I can't.' As he spoke he took a swift glance about the conservatory, assured himself of their momentary privacy, and catching her to him, laid a fugitive pressure on her lips. To counteract the audacity of this proceeding, he led her to a bamboo sofa in a less secluded part of the conservatory, and sitting down beside her, broke a lily of the valley from her bouquet. She sat silent, and the world lay like a sunlit valley at their feet. "'Did you tell my cousin Ellen?' she asked presently, as if she spoke through a dream. He roused himself, and remembered that he had not done so. Some invisible repugnance to speak of such things to the strange foreign woman had checked the words on his lips. "'No, I hadn't the chance after all,' he said, fibbing hastily. "'Ah!' She looked disappointed, but gently resolved on gaining her point. "'You must, then, for I didn't either, and I shouldn't like her to think—' "'Of course not. But aren't you, after all, the person to do it?' She pondered on this. "'If I'd done it at the right time, yes. But now that there's been a delay, I think you must explain that I'd asked you to tell her at the opera, before our speaking about it to everybody here. Otherwise she might think I had forgotten her. You see, she's one of the family, and she's been away so long that she's rather... sensitive." Archer looked at her glowingly. "'Dear and great angel! Of course I'll tell her!' He glanced a trifle apprehensively toward the crowded ballroom. "'But I haven't seen her yet. Has she come?' No, at the last minute she decided not to. At the last minute, he echoed, betraying his surprise that she should ever have considered the alternative possible. Yes, she's awfully fond of dancing, the young girl answered simply. But suddenly she made up her mind that her dress wasn't smart enough for a ball, though we thought it so lovely, and so my aunt had to take her home. Oh, well, said Archer, with happy indifference. Nothing about his betrothed pleased him more than her resolute determination to carry to its utmost limit that ritual of ignoring the unpleasant in which they had both been brought up. "'She knows as well as I do,' he reflected, "'the real reason of her cousin's staying away, but I shall never let her see by the least sign that I am conscious of there being a shadow of a shade on poor Ellen Olenska's reputation.'" End of chapter 3